Hello, everybody. All right. Welcome back to This Week in Housing San Diego, May 15th. This is episode four. I'm your host, Ryan Real. Thank you, everybody, for coming, whoever is on the Zoom and on the Facebook. Welcome. Joined today by insurance agent and expert, Randy Mark. Randy, how are you today? Doing good, Ryan. Happy Friday to you. You too. You too. All right, so uh, Randy is going to be joining us today, obviously going to be talking about some homeowners, renters insurance, general insurance um, as it pertains to housing, and then anything interesting that he has seen with insurance as we're going through the coronavirus situation. So all right, let us get rolling. So as we always say, the methodology, we are looking for long-term and reliable resources for market information and analysis, as well as the science behind their analysis. These are just some of the resources that we're using. Definitely need to highlight Keeping Current Matters. Dave Childers and Steve Harney and the crew over there are doing outstanding work. A lot of the research and graphics are from them, so thank you, gentlemen. Uh, from there, disclaimer, every week we give it. Nobody can give you perfect advice. If anybody claims to, run from them far and fast. They are a snake oil salesman. This is what, you're, this is what we are seeing take place. This is what the science has to say. And based on that, this is the best advice that we can give you. All right, so let's bring Randy in. Randy, welcome to the show. The floor is yours. Give us the lowdown on insurance. Thank you, Ryan, and hello to everybody watching this. Um, so basically, there's some challenging times in the industry, um, even before the COVID situation. Um, really, the uh, fire, wildfire issues have been an ongoing problem in Southern California. In the last couple of years, it's uh, come to a bit of a head. So um, one thing uh, to be aware of is when you're putting an offer on a home, uh, uh, Ryan's working with you on that. Uh, check with your insurance agent or broker before to make sure that it's not an area because there are um, outlying areas in the county and even some areas that you wouldn't expect that are um, off limits for um, almost all the insurance companies. Um, one area in particular is the zip code of, nine, not to get too specific, but um, the zip codes of 92117 and 92111, which is in the Claremont area. Uh, we never had any issues with that whatsoever, but now in the last year or two, there are pockets in there that are right on canyons and um, they're off limits according to the Fireline score. The Fireline score is a standardized uh, mechanism where insurance carriers determine what the risks are for the wildfires. So those are areas that some people would be really surprised that it's, uh, it's difficult or sometimes impossible. To there is uh, a thing, uh, an entity called the California Fair Plan. I don't know if you've heard of that, Ryan. Have you heard of I California? Have it's uh, basically a last resort homeowner's insurance. So if you find yourself in a situation where you can't obtain farmers or a normal, reputable mainstream company, the California Fair Plan is an option. Um, it doesn't cover a lot of things that you would like, such as personal liability, slip and fall, or theft of your belongings, or a burst pipe water damage, but it will give you the fire insurance that the lender requires for you to close and to qualify for a loan. So it is, uh, a good thing uh, that you can march forward and go ahead and still buy the house. Um, not a complete policy, but definitely better than nothing. Um, so that's an area that is a challenge today. Um, another uh, point of interest in regards to renter's insurance, um, renter's insurance is extremely important for tenants, obviously, to cover your belongings. But from a homeowner's point of view, if you own a rental property or an investment property, uh, it's really important to have uh, a lease agreement written up. And I'm sure Ryan can advise further on the details of how to do that. But uh, that would require or at least strongly encourage the tenant to carry renter's insurance. Because what, what happens is tenants usually figure that if anything happens, it's on the landlord. 
But what they don't realize is if there is a burst pipe and they can't live there, uh, the landlord's not going to pay for them to stay in a hotel. The landlord may discount the couple weeks that you can't stay there because of the water damage, but it costs an awful lot for, for temporary housing. So renter's insurance is uh, very inexpensive. It's about 130 bucks a year, 10 bucks a month. Um, pretty much a no-brainer. It'll cover your belongings. And for, for the homeowner, it'll just eliminate a lot of headaches and potential lawsuits that the tenant may try to throw at you for um, stuff that happens that, that they're not covered for. Um, so that those are two main issues. Um, uh, another issue that we're seeing a lot of that's always been an issue since my 29 years in the insurance business is replacement costs. So when a house burns down, um, <laughs> I don't know if you know anybody, Ryan, who's lost a home in a fire. Um, or not, but I've seen a few over the years. But what always seems to happen is the cost of rebuilding the home is way more than you think. Um, incredibly more expensive. Number one, you have things like debris removal, uh, demolition of the existing structure, there's hallway costs for the debris, there could be asbestos treatment, and things have to be packaged and specially hauled. So just that, before you even put a nail in rebuilding the house, you can rack up thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars. So when you insure your home, you got to pay special attention to how much is on the dwelling coverage on the homeowners, and that dwelling is uh, it just goes really quick because the contractor and the the permits, fees, architecture fees, engineering costs, all of that that goes into rebuilding a home. Uh, much, much more expensive than you would think, um, particularly if the home has upgrades. But even a basic home uh, in San Diego County today is just, I, my best advice is go with a high deductible and just go as high as you can on the dwelling cost. <clears throat> if you think you're insured enough, add another 20 or 30 percent to it. It's a prudent practice um, and, and money well spent. Um, so those are the main areas that, that I would say we're seeing the most uh, issues on that could be the most important as it relates to, um, to your clientele, Ryan, and potential clientele. Mm -hmm. Okay. I love it. I love it. Um, are there any big changes that you can discuss and, and share with everybody about maybe something that's changed due to the coronavirus or something that you see once we come out of this or as we are more and more coming out of this that you're going to see being different than it was before? I haven't seen anything directly related to that with respect to homeowners insurance. Um, auto insurance carriers are discounting for lesser driving, but that's kind of off our topic a little bit. Um, but no, I haven't seen anything in relation to homeowners insurance on, uh, on the COVID issue. Um, there, there has been questions with regard to if you're a landlord and you own a rental and your tenant can't live there uh, if the homeowner's insurance is going to pay for that as a claim because the tenant, you know, can't, can't pay for it. And they might say that the virus should be a covered loss, but uh, that's something that's excluded in homeowner's policies. So as a landlord, if your tenant can't pay to, due to the virus, uh, you're not going to be able to claim that. Um, even commercial policies for, for resident, uh, I'm sorry, for buildings and, and, uh, industrial units and thing, office buildings, uh, insurance companies are not covering uh, loss of rents due to the virus. So it's, it's a really difficult situation uh, that we're in. And um, unfortunately, it doesn't look like homeowners is paying for that type of situation for landlords. Okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. Anything else that, that we need to know? Uh, not that I can think of off the top of my head. If any off the wall questions come to you, I'm happy to answer them, of course. Um, oh, yeah, one more thing really quick. Okay. With regard to claims, we have seen some issues where, um, you know, the landlord uh, has a claim on a rental property and the water restoration company maybe is not being let in because the tenant doesn't want to let people in the house. <laughs> so um, it, it is important that you go with a very reputable water restoration company. Most homeowners carriers, including farmers, 
uh, we have a rapport with one particular water restoration company that is very reputable and follows all the protocol so that uh, customers and tenants can be uh, feel safe of somebody coming in their house and not being uh, endangering the family. So I think that's an important consideration. All right. <clears throat> that sounds good. That sounds good. Well, we do have a few questions that had come in ahead of time. Um, not, you know, everybody knew that we were bringing on, bringing on an insurance expert. So we do have some questions. We'll see if any others come in. We'll save all those for the end. Sure. Um, so, all right, cool. Let's keep moving through. So let's get to the housing. So this is the real estate on the ground update. This is the fourth iteration of the slide. You guys can obviously see it's a little longer left to right. Um, all right, let's get oriented. So this is looking uh, weekly is where we have the hash marks going back to March 1st. Uh, so the red line that we're seeing here, this is essentially when the stay at home order was given right around March 19th. All right, so what we're looking at here are new listings. The one thing that I want to tell you before we get into all this real estate update is all of this is building on the previous three episodes, all right? So if there is something that is not making sense, feel free to call, text, or email. I would love to discuss it with you. But if you want, the YouTube channel has all the episodes. It has all the segments broken out. So you could head over there, youtube.com slash the letter C slash Ryan Real. It'll be somewhere at the end of this. Um, but ultimately that's where you're going to be able to find this. Okay. So what we know prior to the coronavirus is we had historically low inventory, low number of homes, historically speaking in San Diego County, coronavirus rolls around and we can see that that very clearly dropped down. We can see that roughly one, two, three, four, five weeks of just kind of humming around, not a lot of new stuff coming on, but still properties coming on. Remember, real estate, buying and selling homes, property, that is an essential service. There's some people that disagree with that and, and okay, that's fine. It's the, the example that I gave last time was the 67 year old couple who has two kids and six grandkids that just lost 67% of their life savings when the coronavirus came and the stock market dropped. They are got stuck in a position where they have to sell their home, buy some little condo and have money to live the rest of their lives off. That I would argue is an essential, is, is a necessity and it's essential, all right? So the people that you see buying and selling once the coronavirus came along, they had a very good reason to do it, all right? And so what we're starting to see, people are becoming more and more comfortable with the coronavirus and what the potential threats are, et cetera. If we were to draw a line of best fit, call it from roughly April 5 to today, we can see that it is definitely trending upwards, meaning more and more new listings. The exciting part of this is what has basically happened at the very end of April into May. We are starting to see more and more homes come on the market, which is wonderful news. We are gonna get more into the housing market specifically across the country towards the end of this, but if you're wanting the detailed analysis, the last three episodes have all the info you could ever want, all right? So new listings, more and more of them are coming on. Here's the pending listings, right? So remember, pending is an offer is accepted. The property comes off the market into a pending status. You can see the number of transactions that were popping along pre-coronavirus. And then come the 19th, we just plummeted down to the basically the bare necessities, all right? We know that it basically plopped along for about three weeks. And then it has started to increase very nicely as we have gone through the month of April and into the month of May. All right, so this is, this is good news. This is very good news for people. This is another view of the same thing where now we have the pending and the new on the same graph, okay? We want to ideally have six to seven months worth of homes in terms of months worth of inventory on the market. It's a good, healthy market. In San Diego, if we have four months, that's considered a pretty healthy market, maybe even a buyer's market. We're down around 1.8 months worth of inventory right now in the county, right? So whenever we are going to see an increase in new listings, that is a great sign for the county. When we see the number of active and pendings going up, that's even better, right? So we can see the number of pending transactions for the beginning of March were tremendously higher than the number of available properties. That means we were buying them at a faster rate than they were coming on. That all switched right around the 19th of March 
and we can see that the new listings started largely outpacing the sales, all right? We also know that right around the middle of, right around April 20, April 21, 22, somewhere in there, we crossed back over briefly to where we had a lot of buyer activity picking up, and along with that, we then started to see the listing activity picking up, all right? So all of this on the far right-hand side is very, very promising, all right? Remember, we talked about the housing market for the last three episodes, and it is in a very, very strong position, especially considering where it was going into 2008. We are not in that position, all right? If you're wanting to dig into that, go to the YouTube channel. It's all broken down over there. But the market itself, based off of equity alone, is in a tremendously stronger position. Look at the month's worth of inventory. You look at the appreciation rates. You look at the limited number of cash out refinances. The housing market is positioned to pull the economy out of the Great Repression that we are in right now, instead of driving us further into it, which it did in 2008. And right, so this is going to be the big chart right here. This is the one that's going to kind of break this down. So let me orient you guys. The columns, we have obviously the categories. We have May 1 to 7, so the first week of May, second week of May, the total, and then the May projections. All right, so last week, that first week of May, we had 856 new listings come on, 670 pending. That was a net gain of 186. That was a very, very good, good week. That was a very good piece of news for everybody. The projections for the month of May were at a 14% increase in inventory. That is huge. We now look at the data that came in from the second week of May. We had fewer listings, 770 compared to 856. We had the same number of homes, which is kind of odd and surprising in and of itself, but I did double check it. 670 listings went pending. So we had a net gain of 100. So if we simply look at this last week, that's saying we're going to have an increase of 7.6%. If we extrapolate all this out, the current projections that we have for the increase in inventory in May is an 11% increase, all right? We talked last time about the numbers and kind of comparing them historically within San Diego. And we said, a lot of the numbers are looking like last month, we were kind of in December, maybe getting into January, which would mean this month, May, is January maybe going into February, right? Remember, February, March timeframe, that's where it starts to really heat up here. So we could be looking at essentially a delayed spring Come June, especially into July and August, the activity, I think, is going to be tremendously higher, where normally by August in San Diego, it has dropped off dramatically. So I think we're simply going to see a shift, right? One analogy I heard about this is comparing the housing market to uh, the restaurant industry, right? When the, when the coronavirus came around, restaurants were shut down and everybody said, okay, well, we still have to eat. Let's okay. make our food at the house. The, those were lost transactions. That was lost income, lost revenue for the restaurants. For housing, people didn't say, ah, eh, we'll just skip buying a house. It's cool. They hit the pause button, right? So there is a tremendous amount of pent up buyer demand. And we're going to get into that here in a little bit. But before we do that, let's get back into the unemployment. We had the new numbers come out. We knew they were going to be bad, but let's take a look and see what are the experts saying. So Ben Bernanke, formal Fed, uh, Fed chairman, uh, I don't find comparing the current downturn with the Great Depression to be very helpful. The expected duration is much less and the causes are very different, right? So this goes to the depth and the length that we've talked about. We do have an updated version of that slide today. Very, very different. What we are experiencing right now is event-based. It is strictly due to the coronavirus. We had a phenomenally strong economy going into this, and then we decided to hit the pause button, right? That is not the norm. When we talk about the Great Depression, we had systemic issues. When we talk about the Great Recession, we had systemic issues. We don't have those right now. We take a look at uh, Wall Street Journal National Economics Correspondent, Josh uh, Zumbrin. News stories often describe the coronavirus-induced global economic downturn as the worst since the Great Depression. This is likely to be literally true, yet for many, the comparison does more to terrify than to clarify. Let's look at the numbers. Let's see what we're talking about. All right, so 
Here's a chart that is comparing the numbers, unemployment numbers from the Great Depression, 32, 1933, 1934, 1935, to the coronavirus, so 2020, 21, 22, 23. And right? we're using the Goldman Sachs projections. All right, so we are currently at 14.7% unemployment. We also know that that's going to go up when we get the next report in June. That number is going higher, and we're going to get to that. In 1932, with the Great Depression, 23.6%. 1933, 25%. We're projected at 9% next year. 21, 22% in 1934. We're projected at 7.8. 20% in 1935. We're predicted at 6.6. There is a huge difference, and here's the numbers. This is the science. This is the research, and this is what the numbers tell us, guys. Here it is. These are two completely different things. The Great Depression had systemic issues. We're dealing with a pandemic. When we take a look at the unemployment, right, the newest box in here on the right, 2.9 million, right? It's not good. That's 2.9 million people that they don't have a paycheck. They can't support their family. They're now being forced to rely upon the government for this or hopefully something other than the government. It's not good. But what is good about this? What, what can we take away from this slide? We know we've hit the peak. We know we've hit the peak. We know we're on the downswing. We know that there are only so many more people that are going to lose their jobs at this point based off of the industries that were closed and based off of the general reopening plans that we've seen across the country. All right. So not good numbers, but it is not horrific. All right, so last week we dug into this a lot more than we're going to now, but I want to just touch on this briefly. This is a breakdown of the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, the percentage by category, all right? 37, 38% of the people that had lost their jobs are servers and bartenders, all right? Remember the initial one, it was, it was close to 60%. We know that these uh, businesses are going to start to open again. We know that they're not going to open at 100%, but we do also know that the takeout and the delivery and all of the other things that are going on as business owners have innovated throughout this, the server that can't get a shift delivering food to a table is going to get a shift doing takeout, is going to get a shift doing delivery. Right? There's a lot of good things that are happening. Retail is coming back on in California. Temporary services, a little bit. Right? These are more professional services. We need the doctor's offices to get back online, the dentist, the cardiologist, the diabetes specialist. There is a tremendous number of people across the country that have delayed medical care because of this. All right? So that is coming back, which is going to bring back temporary services. Arts and entertainment. In parts of the country, they're doing it, and they're not having any issues, amazingly enough. All right? So when is this going to come back in San Diego? We'll have to see. We do have a little bit of a little bit of a disagreement between San Diego County and the state. So we'll see how that goes. Manufacturing, childcare. We know those are coming back. Childcare is going to come back. All right. We just need to get some guidance for it. All right. So in general, we know this is going to come back. All right. Let's see what we're all, what else we're looking at. All right. So here is the depth and the length graph. This is the continually updated one. We did update this for this week. We need to understand the depth and the length. Depth being how many people are, have lost their job. The length meaning how long is it going to last. So we have depth going up and down on the y-axis, length uh, left to right on the x-axis. When we take a look at the Great Depression, there it is. 25% unemployment at the peak, right? 1929 to 1942, it took 12 plus years to get back to where they were. Here's the Great Recession, 9%, 10% was the lowest, nine years. We've seen multiple projections last week, and prior to that, Goldman Sachs was at 15, uh, I think it was JP Morgan last week that was at 20%. Goldman Sachs has updated their numbers. They now see it dropping to 25%. That means next month, we are going to have a bad jobs report again. It's coming. We know it. You now know it. We all don't have to freak out like chicken littles and go running around the street going, oh, my God, the world's going to come to an end. All right. So what is this graph showing us? 
the Great Repression or the coronavirus, it has a tremendous amount of depth. It is impacting a lot of people at this point. We also know previously it was expected to potentially go for two years. Now it's being extended out. It could go three or four. But we do know that just based off the projections, we're going to be at 10% or less next year. All right. So do we have the depth? Absolutely. Do we have the length? We do not. Is the length increasing? Some projections are, but there's nothing definitive yet. And right? so that's where we're at with unemployment so far. Um, here's a great quote from the deputy chief economist at First American. Our analysis shows that the nature of the service sector driven recession is unlikely to result in a one-to-one -one decline in home ownership demand because those being impacted disproportionately by the recession are much less likely to have been hunting for a house in the first place. All right, so as we transition to talking about housing now, this is something that we do have to take in mind. The, how many of the people that have lost their job due to this were actively looking for a home? So here's another graph. This one is showing the job loss percentages based off of income. 40% of the people that have lost their job make less than 40K a year. Those are a lot of kids, college students, kids directly out of college, part-time workers. These are not high-skilled workers. 19% is between 40K and 100K. Now we're starting to get into skilled workers. We get into over 100K, that's only 13%. That, in general, requires some skill. Right? So. How many of the college kids, how many of the high school kids, how many of the people with a part-time job were actively out looking for a home before this started? I would take a guess that not that many of them. I would say that somewhere between the 19% and the 13%, these are your home buyers. Right? So that is another data point. It's another good piece of news for the housing market. Right? Here's the big graph that we've gone through each week. So these are the projections for GDP, all right? So we now have added Bank of America. So we now have the five major institutions. Remember, we originally started with only Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, and Morgan Stanley. Added Wells Fargo, now we've added Bank of America. We know that the GP, GDP was negative 4.8 for Q1. We know that in order to formally be in a recession, we have to get all the way through Q2, which means we are through April, May, and June, which means it will be the end of July, August before we have the final numbers. So are we technically in a recession? No. Are we functionally in one? Yes, we are. All right, so we spent a tremendous amount of time previously talking about types of recessions. Everybody, to now include Bank of America, still predicting a V-shaped recovery, a sharp drop down, very well-defined bottom, and a skyrocketing ride back up to the top. All right, so let's take a look at some of these numbers. Every single financial house is predicting massive losses in Q2. We're already feeling that. This week in and of itself is probably, economically speaking, financially speaking, one of the worst that we have had throughout this thing. It's, it is the worst that we've had with the job reports and a lot of the stuff that's come out over the last week to 10 days, right? We know that next week's is probably going to be the same, if not worse. We know that we are in the worst of this right now, and we know that we will come out of this. All right, so going into Q3, if you remember from last week, Wells Fargo had, was predicting a negative GDP in Q3. They are now up in the positive. Well, uh, Bank of America now has the negative one. All right, so Bank of America, welcome to the game. You can revise this next week, and it'll be fine. All right, but here's the interesting thing. Bank of America is the only one predicting the low, the negative, but they are also the only one that's predicting a genuine skyrocket in Q4. It's an interesting piece of data right there. All right, so that should make everybody rest a little easier with the economy. All right, and here's a great quote. This is the Morgan Stanley Chief Investment Officer. We believe the U.S. economy is set for a U-shape or even a V-shape recovery where the economic activity will bottom perhaps very soon and then very steadily recover. All right, so a little bit of a little bit of a U thrown in there. We've talked about this, but here's why it can't be a U-shaped recession. A U-shaped recession is a very slow drop to the bottom 
relative to a V. Has anything been slow about the last six weeks? Do I, do I need to go back to look at the unemployment claims and we can figure out whether this has been a slow drop to the bottom? All right, I think everybody would agree we, we just dropped like a rock. All right, so take it for what you want. All right, so now talking more about the recovery. All right, what are we looking at? For the first six decades after World War II, the housing sector led the rest of the economy out of each recession. Expect it to do the same this time as well. That's the chief economist over at CoreLogic. If we look at the chief economist for the National Association of Home Builders, as the economy begins to re a recovery later in 2020, we expect housing to play a leading role. Housing enters this recession underbuilt, not overbuilt. That was a big problem in 2008 leading into it. Based on demographics and current vacancy rates, the U.S. may have a housing deficit of up to 1 million units. Low inventory. All right, so here, let's get to this right here. Homeowners that are out there, a couple different things for you. If you've had any thoughts of selling your property, you want to move up, you want to move down, you want to move left, right, or do a different state, now is a good time to do that. You can join in and contribute largely to the recovery of our economy sell your home. Those of you that have not had any thoughts of selling your house, but you've lived in it for more than, let's say, four or five years, you've gotten a little more familiar with your house over the last six to seven weeks, I'd imagine. What are some things that you want to change in that house? Is there one room in particular you can't stand anymore? Can it be changed? And is it time to sell that house and buy a different one? Just saying. And so, more into the housing, right? So this is a data tree by First American. The housing market has proven to be incredibly resilient in the face of recent pandemics. History suggests the housing market is likely to fare better through pandemics and recover more quickly than the overall economy, right? We have not seen housing prices drop. It simply hasn't happened. In San Diego this month, we set another all-time high for the median sales price. Pricing isn't going down. Here's another quote from CNBC. I think we saw this one last week. Evidence is mounting that the home buyers may be coming back to the market after demand plummeted in the past month due to the coronavirus. More good news. Here's buyer activity, right? We saw this graph last time, right? We know that activity always picks up at the first of the year. That's what we see here in January. Up, 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 coronavirus pops in, boop, all the way down to nothing. Starts to come back up little blip down and as of last week we're like it's coming back here's the updated graph real estate's back ladies and gentlemen if you're looking to buy or sell a home and you want to continue to sit on the couch that will have an impact now is the time to re-engage and get back in the game all right you can see very clearly right around 418 or so this is when it dropped last time they've now revised that we are well back up and on our way. More and more home buyers. All right, now this slide, we had this one last week. I was gonna pull it off, but I decided to leave it on. This is the seller traffic in February, All right? Dark blue, meaning a lot of people going, hey, we need to sell. The light blue, stable amount of people. The gray, not a lot of people raising their hands. This was in February, there's March. That's the coronavirus. Here's buyer activity. That's February. The entire country, minus North Dakota and Louisiana, we're going crazy looking for something to buy. Here's, Fe here's March. Still there. A little more light blue. The buyers are there, ladies and gentlemen. The inventory's not. All right, let's get to a couple more slides. New listings taken year over year. We know that the first few weeks of March, we had an absolute bottoming out. We were down over 40%. We now see that very much coming back to life. These are new listings. Market's coming back, ladies and gentlemen. This is from Zillow. New listings and pending sales. Week over week, as of May 12th, new listings up 6%, new pendings up 7 That's national. We already went over the San Diego numbers, all right? So that's the housing market. That's unemployment, the economy, the recovery. It's a definite update from last week, some new stuff put in there. So I'm gonna bring Randy back in. 
a little too far. There we go. All right, Randy, welcome back. Thanks All right, so that's going to be the end of what we got there. We're going to go to the Q&A. So I do have some questions that were sent in earlier, email, social media, and the such. Um, so we're going to go through them. Randy, before we go, any questions or anything like that along the lines of what you just uh, saw? I, I did have one more thing I wanted to add super quick here, not to take up too much more time, but um, go for claims, it. especially water claims, are an issue when you're buying a home. So as a home buyer, you can literally uh, – put an offer on a home and that particular home has had a water claim or two in the past five years. And even though it wasn't your house, your insurance carrier may have a problem ensuring you buying that. So just like with the high risk fire areas, the moral of the story I think is, is contact your insurance agent or broker uh, before you put an offer on the house, I think is the best thing. Have them run the address, you know, give you the all clear before you put the offer, both from a wildfire point of view and from a, a claims point of view. So um, that that I just wanted to throw that last piece in the puzzle for for the challenges presented with fires. That's a that's a great point, Randy, and it's something I think that the the more skilled agents, um, those of us that are out here doing it every day, it, have definitely picked up on that. Especially the water is a topic oh, yeah. we can get to. Just had yep. to deal with that at the beginning of the year. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's, you know, so home buyers that are out there, all right? Part of the purchase agreement is going to be a natural hazards disclosure report, right? And that's something normally that the seller is going to pay for. 99% of the time, they have not ordered that before they accept an offer and, and get into escrow. That is in general, we can look up and see, is it in a floodplain? Is it in a fire plane? We have a very good idea about that. This is where it matters who you work with, right? If you're working with your uncle who just got his license and felt like selling, you know, his brother's home, or you're working with an agent that buys or sells two or three homes a year, good luck. Good <laughs> luck. You very well might end up like the buyers almost ended up with the transaction with the, with the townhouse we were selling at the beginning of the year, right? Where they, it, it got pulled out of the fire for that. They came extremely close to, to losing that condo over it. Um, and that was a water issue. Yeah, water is uh, was not my favorite topic at the <laughs> beginning of the year. Uh, yeah, so if those of you that own properties, if there is water leaking, please address that sooner rather than later, or you're going to have oh, somewhere yeah. between 10 to 15 grand worth of mold remediation as you're trying to close your property and move. Not a fun thing to deal with. All right. So that's that's a great great thing to point out. Um, so. All right, let's get to some of the other questions, Randy. Let's start off with one for you, kind of going in line with what we were actually just talking about, fire zones, flood zones, uh, sure. fire planes. Give us, a, give us a little bit more on that. Obviously, you know, a flood is, it can flood, fire, you're in high risk of having a fire. From the insurance perspective, what are some of the things you guys are looking at? How do you make those determinations? Well, um, with the flood, those, those high risk flood zones are determined by FEMA. Um, the government program. So I, I believe lenders and Ryan, you're probably familiar with this, but with respect to the loans, uh, lenders will require flood insurance from the buyer to qualify for the loan uh, if it's in a high risk flood zone. So you do want to, again, I think it all gets back to just don't be that guy that, that calls the insurance agent five days before close and goes, hey, I need homeowner's insurance. I just found out. Don't be that guy. You know, make make your do your research and your due diligence both on the house and on the insurance well before you put the offer in um, and then in terms of the fire zone uh, again uh, there's a standardized uh, thing called a fire line score and um, different areas of, of california have different risks and with an address your insurance broker can check um, most areas like I can tell you right off the bat, Julian, Ramona, real tough to get insurance. Um, Poway, hit and miss, but can be tough. Rancho Bernardo, Penasquitos can be tough. I see Ryan nodding his head. Um, but, you know, inner city, city areas, downtown, um, University City, uh, National City, Chula Vista, generally all green lights for those type of areas. But, you know, just don't leave it to chance. Just 
you know, give your agent a call. Usually in five or 10 minutes, he or she can run those checks for you. One less thing to worry about. That's what I would say. That makes sense to me. <clears throat> All right, let's grab a real estate one. All right, so one that was sent in, how are we keeping buyers and sellers safe today? There are a lot of different protocols we have. Um, you'd actually head over to the website, wannabereg.com. They're on the, the homepage, I think, at this point. Uh, basically, we've moved everything into the virtual sphere that we can. Right? So um, if I'm going to meet with a buyer, if I'm going to meet with a potential seller, initially, pre-COVID, the buyers would come to the office. Sellers, we would go to the house. At this point, we're not doing that. Um, any of the buyer consultations, real estate advisor consultations are being done on Zoom. Uh, and that, that's just, it is simply safer at this point, protecting the home buyers. All right. When it comes to the sellers, in general, we're not going into the house. Uh, we've set up a lot of different, very interesting systems in place to do a virtual listing appointment. A lot of it relying upon the homeowner to take some photos, to take some videos, to upload them specifically so we can do the analysis that we would normally need to do when we're walking through. And then from there, the listing presentation and the marketing presentation itself are actually being done online. As it pertains to going out into the field, again, there aren't a lot of, there are no open houses. Let's put it that way. There are no in-person open houses. There are physical showings taking place. There is a uh, property advisory entry disclosure form, P or property entry, PEAD, whatever you want to call it. Uh, basically saying you're going into a house, you don't know what you're going to get. And if you catch the coronavirus and die, the homeowner is not responsible. Right? So anybody who's wanting to go look at a house, you're going to have to sign that at this point. So am I as the agent that's going to take you in there. Masks, gloves, booties, hand sanitizer, social distancing, all in place. Those of you guys that have more questions about this, call, text, or email. You see all my info right there. I'll be more than happy to explain this. I do not want to take the next 15 minutes to dig into that because it just is too much at this point. But the, point, the, main, the main point I want you to take away from this, we've moved a tremendous amount of this to the virtual world. And when we do need to go do something in person, your safety is always in the forefront of our mind. Masks, gloves, temperature checks. If somebody's feeling ill, they are not working with people, et cetera. All right. So that is ultimately how we are keeping people safe. All right, Randy, let's go to an insurance one. Um, biggest concerns that you have with getting a policy after buying or that a buyer should have what are, the, what are some of the biggest things they need to be worried about? And we know we've talked about fire, we've talked about flood, we've talked yep. a little bit about water. Okay, so one other thing is the condition of the home. Um, insurance companies wanna see quote unquote pride of ownership. Um, so if you're buying a home that is, uh, needs a new roof or the, the fascia is uh, dry rotting or you know just some other conditions that just look like a home that's not taken care of properly, homeowners insurance companies will, will not want to insure that home, basically. It's considered a higher risk. So um, that's one thing to be aware of um, when you are buying the house. Make sure, and it all ties back to have your insurance company check ahead of time. Have your agent go out there, take a look at the outside. He or she doesn't have to go inside the house. It's really the outside that they're looking at. Um, that's one issue. Um, that I think is pretty important, uh, the pride of ownership. And, and if you're gonna do construction on a home, that can be an issue. So if you buy a home and you're going to uh, bulldoze it or do the old builder owner one wall standing renovation, uh, homeowner's insurance won't cover that. You're gonna have to get a special type of policy called a builder risk or what's called course of construction policy. So, uh, best to tell your agent or broker what your plans are ahead of time. Um, don't be that guy that tries to sneak it through, you know, close on the insurance, get it going, and then all of a sudden there's a surprise because you might end up with something that's not can uh, covered. Also, if you're buying a house and it's going to be a rental, make sure you tell your insurance carrier it's going to be a rental and not owner-occupied. <laughs> if your insurance carrier writes it as owner-occupied and you have a tenant in there and have a claim, guess what, that claim may not be covered, even if the house burns down or it's something that has nothing to do with whether it was tenant or owner-occupied. So I think, again, uh, prudence, uh, 
be upfront and uh, give your broker or agent uh, ample time to do to do the service they need to do for you. Great advice. Great advice. Absolutely, it's amazing that people still try to get this stuff through. It's like people <laughs> running, people getting a high speed chase from the cops. Good luck. There's that thing called a helicopter overhead. You're not running that thing. Man. What are you doing? You know, oh, let's try to do some insurance fraud. They won't find it. Okay. Good luck, my man. Good luck. All right. Let's go to another real estate question. This is a, a standard question every week. When are we having the price drops? We're not. How about that? Um, so let me explain a little bit more. All right, when are we going to see pricing coming down? There aren't buyers out there. The stock market's gone bad. We have a pandemic. Oh my gosh, when it, the last time this happened, it was 2006, 2007, and the, the pricing, and when, when are we seeing price reductions? When are we going to see foreclosures? When are we going to see short sales? The fundamental differences in the housing market from 2006, 7, leading into 2008, versus leading into where we are today are two fundamentally different things. The housing market in general drove that recession in 2008, where we are in a position to pull the economy out of it this time. All right. So just speaking about San Diego County, we are either continuing to set new all-time median sales price records each month, or we are in the general ballpark within a couple thousand dollars of it. There is nothing indicating that pricing is going to come down. There is the supply and demand and everybody is saying, oh, well, there's nothing for sale. There's nothing for sale. True, true. Well, there aren't any buyers, so it's at an equilibrium. But now more buyers are coming out. So if we now have 10 buyers from one home, what's going to happen to the price? What happens if more homes come on the market as more buyers come on the market? We stay at more of an equilibrium. We would have to see... 10 homes come on the market for every one or two buyers. And I'm making up those numbers as I'm talking here. So let's not try to hold me to that ratio, but that in general, we would need to have a massive surplus of properties for sale. Like we did in 2006, seven, eight, nine, we don't have that scenario. So I don't see big price drops coming when we're talking about distressed properties, pre foreclosure, foreclosure, getting a weird feedback. Hmm. Randy, are you hearing that weird feedback? I'm, I'm not. But okay. then again, I, I've got wax in my ears most of the time. So <laughs> ah, my computer is making, uh, it sounds like it's passing gas at me. <laughs> we'll see if it's on the recording. Um, anyways, so back to it. <laughs> um, with with the, the last part of it with, with the distressed properties and whatnot. Last week, we spent a lot of time talking about homeowner equity. And we said yeah. the average mortgage in the United States has $177,000 worth of equity in it. And that is a very big number. Even if we took a massive hit to the housing market, 25% instead of 20%, like we saw in 2008, these homeowners are still going to have $125,000 to $130,000 worth of equity in their home. They're not walking away from it. And if this continues to go on and on and on, and we stay at, stay at home and lock down and all this craziness, then we could have some issues if we get to August and September and we're still doing this. Right? But as we are right now, I don't see there being very much in the way of price drops and distressed properties. All right. So uh, there's that. We kind of lumped two in a row into that. So, all right, Randy, got a couple more for you. What's the strangest claim you've ever seen filed as it pertains to either homeowners or renters? Strangest claim ever filed. <laughs> I, I'm saying it out loud. Uh, my assistant's about 30 feet away, and I'm wondering if uh, she remembers any. But we, we've had some doozies, that's for sure. Any off the top of your head? Oh, yeah, yeah. Actually, she remembers one, but I remember one. Um, I had a customer with a, a mattress. They got a new mattress in the in the rental home, and it was right out of a Seinfeld episode. The mattress had a horrible stench, like it was possessed. And they had all kinds of experts come in with zoot, zoot suits trying to get the odor out of the mattress, and they literally couldn't live in the house. They were getting sick. They were getting nauseous. The mattress manufacturer, the retailer, nobody would accept responsibility. 
they turned in a claim and of course that wasn't covered and um this went on for months and months and um I, i'm not even sure what the end of it was it happened years ago but that was definitely one of the the oddest claims i've seen yep <laughs> a mattress okay <clears throat> all right i got it let's go with another one for you randy um what is so this is guy wrote in what is the difference between different insurance companies um it, is there a difference in what sets uh farmers apart from the others well uh there's yeah there's a lot of difference so um a lot of companies are geared towards uh the business model being 1-800 cheap is don't have an agent you're basically a number computer now some people like that um some people don't so if you like that and you're you just want the cheapest policy possible um but you, if you want the cheapest policy possible you're going to be switching insurances every six months or every year because it literally rates up and down so farmers is uh, an all-service insurance company uh a little bit old-fashioned but we believe in having an agent uh, a personal agent my customers know me uh we do reviews every year uh as often as we can sometimes more and we want to customize the policy and coverages to be you know to be what the particular customer needs for their for their needs um so a lot of uh customers it's just one size fits all and uh it also with respect to the claims a lot of insurance companies on homeowners claims during the wildfires you would see issues where farmers customers had checks in their hands while their neighbors hadn't even gotten return calls from their insurance company some company on the east coast and they have to fly out adjusters and so with farmers our main claims office is right here in Sereno Valley um the headquarters for the whole country happens to be in West Los Angeles or California you know insurance is a strange product different than pizza when you order pizza you taste it and you eat it and you decide oh this is good or this is not good or it's a rip off or it's not with insurance it's kind of like paying to the air and you just really you don't get to taste that pizza unless you have a claim and a lot of people go years without having a claim so it's kind of difficult sometimes to explain to some why they're paying a few hundred dollars more but i guarantee you when that house burns down or $20,000 water claim uh and the person with the cheap insurance is just left doing everything themselves and uh the insurance company's cutting corners and they throw up their hands and just say I give up I don't have you know I have to work and I can't deal with this and just pay me whatever so that's really where the difference is is uh, how the claims are handled there's a tremendous difference from company to company on how it's done yeah that makes sense would it be fair to say you get what you pay for in most cases that's very fair to say yes <laughs> all good, right good yeah i got gotcha. you all right uh got a couple more real estate ones so one was how is the inventory we talked about that already uh 1.8 months in in san diego county that means extremely low we know more and more properties are coming on that's basically where we're at with inventory uh the last real estate question i do have one more for you at the end randy um yeah. the covid-19 addendum what is that um this is the California Association of Realtor or CAR form CVA uh coronavirus addendum <clears throat> it basically it came out within a week or two of all this starting and basically it formally declared the coronavirus pandemic a force majeure basically an act of god people have the ability to cancel out of an agreement whether you're the buyer or buyer or the seller if you have been directly impacted by the coronavirus um that's the best answer i can give you on that i thankfully have not had to handle that situation this year with this uh i don't think our entire group has at this point um but it is in place and it is something that everybody does have to take into account um but it, it at the end of the day <clears throat> it's there to protect the buyer and or the seller should there be a very serious issue with the coronavirus they are not going to be forced to either sell their property or continue to purchase somebody else's Um so that's that's those two right there. So Randy, the last question um sure. and this one is mine actually for you. Okay. <laughs> what is the number one thing that people don't 
think to ask an insurance agent when it comes to either homeowners or renters that they should be asking? Uh, the number one thing they should be asking, um, I would say uh, ask what's not covered um, because there are a lot of uh, exclusions with most policies, even your best policies have a lot of exclusions. Um, so for example, uh, earthquake insurance is 100% not covered by homeowners insurance. And in San Diego, um, we're, we're really low, pretty low risk for earthquake, but the premiums are really low. So if everybody out there, you know, whether you're my customer or not, call your agent, get a quote on earthquake. Usually your average 12, 1300, uh, 12, 1300 square foot home in Claremont for earthquake insurance is $100 a year. So it's, it's really cheap. If something happens, yeah, you got a high deductible, but you're not going to be left with nothing. So uh, everybody out there, you know, get a quote on earthquake. It's completely excluded right now. Good thing to have. Um, there's a lot of other common exclusions. Um, leaky roof, you know, wear and tear maintenance, those kind of things are not covered. Um, expensive jewelry or collectibles can also be not covered or severely limited in their coverages. So I would say um, anything you feel is out of the ordinary for your situation, uh, ask your insurance company. Um, you're running a business out of home and people are coming in and out, doing daycare from home, definitely check with your insurance company on that. Makes I would say one item that is the most, you know, one big thing, but there's just a lot of little things. You, you don't want to find out what's not covered at the time of the loss. You want to do your best to, to know up front. Yeah. Good advice. Good advice. All right, Randy, was there anything else you want to add before we call it a day? Uh, no, thank you very much. I, I appreciate it. Your, uh, your presentation was educational and helpful for, to me as well. Very well done. Oh, good. I enjoyed it. Good. I'm glad you liked it. I'm glad you liked it. All right. Well, Randy, thanks for joining us. Appreciate your time. I think you provided a lot of very good and valuable information. I know that Everybody knows they have to have insurance. Everybody knows the general, this is homeowner, this is renter. I don't think they understand a lot of the stuff that we covered. So hopefully if you are out there thinking about buying a home, you own a home, you now have heard from the expert about homeowners and renters insurance. All of Randy's information uh, was on the previous screen and we will make sure we get it up uh, for everybody who wants to reach out and get in touch. So Randy, thank you very much for coming on. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Ryan. Everybody have a good weekend. All right, everybody. So this is it for episode four. Have a great weekend and be safe out there.